Good evening. My name is Thomas Steininger. I welcome you to Redevolve, our global edition of our webcast for consciousness and culture. I'm very happy to be here together with Nicanor Perlas, who is here in Germany right now, uh, sitting in Stuttgart. Nicholas, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you so much for your welcome, Thomas. Nicanor, you are, I would say, one of the most prominent thinkers from a consciousness point of view about the uh, potential of the global civil society. At the same time, you are one of the person uh, that I know who really thought most deeply about the implications of artificial intelligence and the, clue, uh, the human implications of artificial intelligence. Yes. So I invited you to talk about uh, both topics because somehow I think they're very much connected yes. and the fact that they're both, as you just said, your passion right. uh, seems to confirm that uh, the future of humanity, of our global uh, society and uh, our technological development, uh, particular artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. artificial super intelligence, mm -hmm. are is something that is worth talking about. So if I may just ask you to share some of your main thoughts, why this is important and what you think are the important uh, parts of the connection of these two topics. Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Thomas. And actually, this is short and a long answer to it. The short answer is that the rapidity of the development of artificial intelligence, it's, it's happening so fast that the decision-making process is just really limited to a few. People who own the technology, people who create the technology, the decision-makers or the investors who are connected with the technology. What is left out is the voice of the citizens. What's left out in the world is the voice of global civil society. So when, as I was saying, uh, one of the voices, the, the, one of the most important voices not heard in this whole discussion and debate is the voice of global civil society. And that's a very large number. But basically, uh, I mean, you're, you're speaking here of billions of people in various forms of organization around the world who are at the receiving end of this technology and they have no power to say anything to this. So it's, I made it my concern to actually Uh, awaken civil society to have a voice uh, in this global debate and to actually impact legislation, impact decisions of, uh, of industry, big tech, and all of that with a civil society perspective. Let me ask the question this way. Isn't the prospect of artificial intelligence that it will bring us together on a global scale Basically, because so many decision processes can be automated, so many mm -hmm. uh, decision processes can be uh, just managed by super smart algorithms, that it allows us to really find a way that we on a global scale can come together. So in that sense, that something like uh, the Internet, as it is doing already right now, mm -hmm. uh, and all uh, the tools of um, modern uh, computer science does bring us together as a global mm -hmm. civil society. Mm -hmm. So basically, my question, isn't artificial intelligence exactly supporting mm -hmm. what you're longing for? Okay, a wonderful question. Uh, artificial intelligence, the, the impact on society, I would, I would classify into three, into three parts. The first part is um, beneficial, it's purely beneficial. For example, you can use artificial intelligence, for example, to monitor how the whales are being killed in the different parts of the world, and then you can, you can mobilize citizen or civil society action to stop the thing. This is just one example. And then uh, global dialogue processes, there are, I know some, so I forget, Lumio, for example, is just an example of software created by, in New Zealand, that allows group this collective decision making on important issues. So these are these are positive examples of the use of the technology, including artificial intelligence. There's a second and very big class of artificial intelligence that's is both positive and negative. So for example, I mean and this where most of the most of the things you see in the newspapers are coming from. The, the most famous example of course is Facebook which is under attack now 
But of course, uh, and I'm not going to go into the reasons why it's under attack. Maybe at some point later I can describe why. Mm -hmm. But that from being a darling of the tech industry, facilitating social media, to becoming considered uh, in the Brit in the in Britain, for example, they're calling them uh, gangsters. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Facebook crowd's a gangster, digital gangster, because they're actually manipulating the minds and so on. So instead of facilitating a kind of the networking, which was its function of social media, it's using that actually to manipulate people's minds, narrowing them, hijacking elections and, and all of this mm -hmm. stuff. And you can go through a gamut of these kinds of AI uses mm -hmm. in education, in health, in weapons construct. I mean, weapons are totally negative. We'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, other areas. The third area of it, artificial intelligence, which is hardly discussed, and this is where I'm focusing on mm -hmm. because uh, there's very little focus on it, is what I'm calling the the negative one. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the autonomous weapons, I mean, everybody's against mm -hmm. it, for example, it's totally negative. But the, the so-called alignment challenge of artificial intelligence, can AI align itself with human values is a, is a huge question where AI experts have no answer. Because with the introduction of machine learning, where algorithms have the capacity using big data to make their own, to reprogram themselves, it's, uh, it's called genetic algorithms or evolutionary mm -hmm. algorithms. You don't need a human being. Mm -hmm. And there's now software creating software, mm -hmm. AI creating other AIs. Mm -hmm. And you enter into a situation where there's a black box and the programmers can no longer follow. Mm -hmm. So they're not sure whether AI will be aligned or not. Mm -hmm. And AI has a survival function, mm -hmm. which means to say it, it will set a goal. One of its the primary things it sets, it does, it's just, it was to make sure that it survives. So mm -hmm. that if you're starting to hinder it from its goal, it's going to be doing all kinds of things to avoid being stopped. Mm -hmm. And the part of the problem is the what's called the specification of the function or the goal of artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. There can be many interpretations of you say you set this goal, you program this goal, it can be understood, understood or uh, uh, implemented by the AI in a different way. So this is called the alignment challenge, and this is the cause of greatest danger to humanity because. Uh, of the speed of which these changes are happening and the amount of data that is able to process and no one can follow it anymore. So those are the three classes of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Beneficial, beneficial but with negative impacts. Mm -hmm. You have like 5G, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. And then uh, the again, negative impacts, weapon, and then artificial super intelligence that no one knows how to align mm -hmm. with the future of humanity. Yeah. And I guess... Uh, your main focus point is uh, the, the fact, uh, uh, what you call the black box. Yes. That uh, in the first time of human history, uh, we create something that has the capacity to supersede our capacity uh, to uh, uh, create society, uh, to co-create reality, mm -hmm. uh, to have a responsible future, that we create something that has a higher capacity to create reality. Right. Uh, I mean, if you look at the evolution of um, not just the human culture, but mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the evolution uh, of our globe, yes. of Earth, yes. uh, we just recently uh, entered a new state Uh, that um, some scientists call the Anthropocene. Yes, exactly. And uh, what makes the Anthropocene the Anthropocene is that uh, for millions of years, uh, we and our ancestors were determined by nature. Yes. But recently, our human capacity turned things completely around. Exactly. That the one single item that really determines the future of the elephant in Africa Right. It's not the sun, it's not the rain, uh, it's not uh, uh, the forest, mm -hmm. it's human decision. Right. So that's a complete turnaround of, yes. of ecological reality. Right. That the ecological reality is in context of our mm -hmm. human reality. That yes. basically nature, uh, we used to be part of nature, 
but to some degree at least, uh, one is justified to say that nature becomes part of us, right. of, our, of our decision process. Right. The, the whole ecological climate crisis is an, a result of this, yeah. that the, the survival of nature as we know it mm-hmm. is determined by human decisions. That's the Anthropocene. It can be right. a good thing, can be a bad thing. Right. It's discussed on both sides. Yes. But as I understand you, this mm-hmm. seems to be a very short time sphere right now. There is already, already the next age lingering. Right. And this is the, I don't have, know the name, the IE uh, scene, uh, where uh, uh, there is a new capacity, a new intelligence, it's, and mm-hmm. it's artificial. Mm-hmm. It's become so predominant mm-hmm. that its decision will determine not only what's happened in nature, but mm-hmm. also, also will determine uh, what, what happens to us. Once a uh, uh, simple way to explain this is, uh, and some people uh, talk about this even in a positive sense, that the relationship that artificial intelligence will have to us will be similar like the relationship that we have right now to our pets. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We can be nice to them and right. we, can be, we, we can take care of them, but basically yeah. Yeah, they're complete at our mercy. Yeah. This is uh, the situation uh, that um, many people are describing yes. and uh, many particular, all the people who really know a lot what's going on yes. are describing. Right. And that maybe we have not thought about it, and you seem yeah. to be one who really tries to to penetrate also our consciousness yeah. that this is an urgent an urgent issue. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There are three things um, on, on this. Um, the first thing is that what I would call the moment, momentum, the Anthropocene. Mm-hmm. The, the Anthropocene, Anthropocene develops specific habits of relating to nature, relating to others. And I think the basic characteristics uh, of, of that epoch, of our, this present epoch, is that we feel the human being can control everything. So the momentum of that is that there are some people, including my friends, some of mm-hmm. my best friends, who think that we can control algorithms mm-hmm. because human beings made them. Mm-hmm. You know, so we are, you know, we are the masters; we can control it. Mm-hmm. But uh, what is unique? Uh, is that this black box, we're creating an algorithm that creates a software that's creating its own software Mm -hmm. and is interacting in an an unpredictable way with trillions of bytes of -hmm. of, of data. Mm -hmm. So we don't exactly know where it is going. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's uh, on certain intellectual functions, it's far superior to the human Mm -hmm. being. You know, an an AI can, today, uh, can actually uh, create, I mean, uh, example like um, it's much faster than the human mind. So in terms of just uh, logical processing of it, mm-hmm. it's a million times faster. So it can do uh, in one year what will be equivalent to a million years for a human being. So you, you can just imagine the tremendous power uh, of, the, of the AI to do that. And then to do that in such a way that we can no longer follow it, that I, th- that I think is where the danger is. And the other problem with this is that this is happening so fast, it's exponential. Mm-hmm. So it's not like in the past where it's just slow, it's just like really taking off so fast that many AI experts are saying we have 10 to 20 years to figure, the average is 20 years to figure out this problem, to mm-hmm. solve what's called the alignment problem, mm-hmm. which can make human beings extinct. I mean, they wipe out humans if we don't figure out how to make a so-called safe artificial super intelligence mm-hmm. that has the functions of all all the functions of a human mm-hmm. being. They they can wipe out humans, or at least we are in no no control anymore if they wipe out humans. If it's maybe uh, from from the artificial intelligence point of view the more rational thing to do because let's say uh, humans are so imperfect that they create a lot of troubles yeah. and the world uh, works much better without them. Yeah. Uh, um, let's just draw on that scenario. Yeah. Uh, we uh, as a civilization, or not we as, a civil, we as humanity, mm-hmm. are, are not in any position to respond anymore. This is the yeah. basic scenario. And, yeah. and you're adding, this is not happening in 100 years, this is happening not in 200 years, you're talking... And again, 
uh, people who are really very close to the process. And yeah. also people who are sometimes not even critical. I say exactly. this is a positive thing. Yeah. I say this is happening in 20 years. Right. So if that's the case, we are losing control right. of our destiny exactly. as a species yes. right now. No, absolutely. Uh, this is this is what's happening. And there, there was a conference in Asilomar, California, 2017, uh, organized by the Future of Life Institute, where they invited AI experts to deal with, with on how to create beneficial AI. Mm-hmm. They're very much aware of the alignment challenge of artificial intelligence. If one looks at the declaration, there are many good things that came out there, mm-hmm. but it's clear they have no solution to this problem of control, of how do you control the AI. You know, people don't realize that artificial intelligence already today, not, the, not yet the most sophisticated kind, they control all the major infrastructure of civilization, the energy infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure, mm-hmm. The, web, the nuclear weapons infrastructure, the stock exchange, any of those can be a source of creating massive problems. And uh, an, the emergence of an artificial super intelligence, which can hack, mm-hmm. or, or can combine together all of those capacities of the existing AI, mm-hmm. can actually launch nuclear weapons at will, mm-hmm. or for example, like without the control of humans but under its own decision, or it can collapse the stock market and create global economic chaos. Mm. This is the situation with this thing. That's why among AI experts, they say only one mistake. Mm -hmm. Then that's it. And uh, if I may add one infrastructure, if you can call it an infrastructure, uh, it is also dominating the thinking infrastructure. Because one of the main discussions that we're having right now about the manipulation of election yeah, uh, and uh, uh, or, or also just the manipulation of the consumer process. Right, uh, is that uh, a superior intelligence uh, can, uh, of course, manipulate our thinking, and this is also uh, as we're experiencing right now, and mm-hmm. part of the democratic problems that we are having right now. Mm-hmm. That this is a fact that, mm-hmm. that basically we, in, if you want to say so, we are not in control anymore of our own thinking process uh, because there is a, a, a manipulating power mm-hmm. of an intelligence mm-hmm. that is to a degree in charge uh, how we think about things because it kind of can also predetermine yeah. how we respond to responses right. Right. that maybe we even lose control of our own thinking process. <laughs> okay. That's, that's really beautiful, Thomas, what you're adding there. Because the first, the first stage of losing that control is actually the loss of our attention forces. Mm-hmm. The, this is the secret of the, everybody, Google, Facebook, social media. They want to capture full time your attention. Mm-hmm. The, st- the stronger you capture your attention, then the more they can manipulate you. And so, but as we know from a spiritual perspective, mm-hmm. To actually control our own thoughts, we need attention to be effective. But that's exactly what's being invaded. Mm-hmm. And there is a master's course in Stanford called Persuasive Technology. Mm-hmm. And the people there in this master's course learn how to create addiction, mm-hmm. how to take control of uh, attention of users. And then they become addicted. And then once they're addicted, you can start doing stuff. And so, yeah, then I want to follow up that that's the first stage, control the attention. And with that, they cannot, they cannot, they can no longer see the more subtle stuff. For example, like Facebook and Google, when you do a Google search, it can actually manipulate what appears in your search. Mm-hmm. The search of the optimization engine is, is rigged. The feed, the feeds, the feed loops of Facebook are actually rigged according to your personality. Mm-hmm. This, these corporations are now taking like as many as 6,000 data points per person. So some of them actually know, know you much better than your own self because they are able to capture facets of your subconscious. Mm-hmm. So you're correct. We are losing control of our own thinking process. And in the process, we're losing democracy. Mm-hmm. We're losing the capacity to think cri- critically about these developments. Mm-hmm. Because they come with benefits. People love, you know, these things. Mm. They, they, they're there. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, like people don't realize if Google gives you 70, 72 free apps, but people don't realize that there are, those are 72 different ways to actually extract data from you and mm-hmm. manipulate you mm-hmm. uh, in the end. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to use myself as a very concrete example. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not a Facebook guy. Okay. I, I, I kind of uh, don't do Facebook uh, so, m- so much anymore. So maybe you're saved um, <laughs> from the manipulation. I, 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 don't, I don't think so. Okay. Because I, I, I'm a really a YouTube guy. You're I, a YouTube. I love a YouTube. I, I love okay. I, I love YouTube. Okay. Uh, and a lot of inspiration. Uh, yeah. for, for example, uh, 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 the most I am contact with your thinking is YouTube. Okay. Uh, uh, that there are all kind of uh, beautiful people uh, that, that I can connect to mm-hmm. uh, that I would have no idea they even exist mm-hmm. uh, uh, if there would not be YouTube. So I, re- right. I really. I have to say, I really love YouTube and the, right. the creative power to connect to uh, right. just beautiful people, the thinking yeah. and all kind of thing. But uh, I, I also see that a lot of people that I got interested in, uh, or not, uh, yeah, you could say a lot, at least some of them, mm-hmm. uh, I did not get interested in because uh, I was searching for them. Mm-hmm. I got interested in them because uh, they showed up. <laughs> Right. They showed up in my YouTube stream, and oh, right. that's interesting. Right. Uh, and from there, I go there, and that's right. interesting. And, then, and uh, it's still interesting. Uh, I, 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 to be honest, I don't regret it uh, necessarily. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I go on a stream where I go on a fringe, and then yeah. all kind of stuff comes in that I really go, oh, gosh, what, yeah. what did I open up here? Right. Exactly. Uh, but that's maybe the only times I'm really aware of what's going on no, because okay. I open it, it's a thing I really didn't want to go into and then it yeah. just comes back right. to me. It's like, Don't you want to have more of that? Exactly. Uh, don't you want to have more of that? But it shows me to some degree mm-hmm. uh, that my interest mm-hmm. gets very precisely targeted. Exactly. And yeah. I have no idea what brilliant science may be behind him to yeah. kind of target the algorithmic mind that is right. Thomas Steininger, right. which is for the, for them just an algorithm that has some habits they know about. Right. Why? Because I, I am I'm a lot on, on, on the internet and right. I, 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 I use Google as a search machine. So they, they definitely know in the priorities. Many, many degrees more about myself than I do. Yeah. And in that degrees, they can do okay. uh, things with me. I have no idea they can do with. Exactly. So um, that's a scary <laughs> situation. Uh, May I ask you, um, uh, isn't it just too late? I mean, I don't want, I want to create a bleak, uh, a, a, a no. bleak uh, uh, out, a scenario. A scenario here. Yeah. But um, uh, what you're describing? Uh, yeah, it's very, it's fascinating what you mentioned about uh, YouTube. And uh, you, YouTube has its own. I mean, this phenomenon is called uh, filter bubble. In other words, you, um, it's a bubble where, because, okay, I'll, I'll step back for a bit. How, how, how are they able to know and target you specifically? Uh, one person uh, used the, the European law of trying to, trying to find what Google has on them. And uh, this guy found out there are 3 million documents that Google had on him. Right. So they had everything from text messages, so search engine and visits, a YouTube. So with that amount of information, you feed that. Mm-hmm. That's nothing to a, mm-hmm. a supercomputer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, supercomputers today can read billions of pages in, a, in less than mm-hmm. a minute. So, and then process it. So the target is very specific. So it actually takes a look at what you like and then repeats it. Mm-hmm. Continually, and then this is what happened. This, it can it can lead to extremism, as you started noticing, mm-hmm. because of the way ideas relate to each mm-hmm. other. So they then you finally start noticing you're going to the fringe. Mm-hmm. But you maybe uh, because of your meditative practice, you're able to notice it. Notice it. Mm-hmm. But most people don't. They just follow the thread, and then before they know it, they're seeing stuff that can actually radicalize their thinking. And this is what they do when you, you go to a Facebook group. It's actually it's an echo chamber, you're just basically hearing yourself there. The same thing happens at Facebook. Facebook, 
after it gives you the feed and get, gets you addicted and so on, it brings you to this group. And then the moment you're in the group, it's an echo chamber of people that are like-minded. And so, but there's no social control because it's basically a uniform monopolized group. I mean, a, a, a non-diverse group. Unlike, let's say, in your real life, you say something outrageous, people will criticize you. Here, done. So that leads to greater and greater extreme. To answer whether it's too late or not, um, this requires a very conscious relationship to technology. Mm -hmm. But one just cannot have this conscious relationship to technology if one cannot control one's own attention forces. Mm -hmm. That's why I think this the age of technology is forcing people to become more and more aware of their consciousness and mm -hmm. practices about consciousness that strengthen consciousness, understanding the nature of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Because when you are in this conscious mode, you can relate with technology. You can stop yourself from being led unconsciously. You, you can see the process. In my own spiritual practice, I can see when, this, uh, when there are thoughts and emotions arising from the subconscious, I can immediately see it and then I can stop it. Most people I understand or I experience, they don't. They're, they're so addicted, they just follow this thing. Mm -hmm. Philippines is the Facebook capital of the world, both mm -hmm. in terms of number and number of hours, five to nine hours a day on Facebook. At that rate, you're basically addicted because Facebook likes and so on design to trigger dopamine releases in the brain, mm -hmm. plus your chemical mm -hmm. in the brain. So they're all addicted there. They kind of think they're just following this thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, for the second class of technology, the positive and the negative, we still can control it. We still have, mm -hmm. if we're conscious, mm -hmm. conscious use of YouTube, mm -hmm. conscious use of Facebook, conscious use of this and that, become more encrypted, do not allow, you know, digital trails to, to infiltrate, mm -hmm. to, to be measured. Mm -hmm. But the third one mm -hmm. is where I would say um, we, we need to stop, actually. Mm -hmm. We need to stop the the development of the black, the more sophisticated machine learning. And of course, that's a very unpopular position, mm -hmm. but maybe difficult to do, but at least that needs to be heard mm -hmm. as, a, as a perspective of citizens around the world. And this is mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do. I'm mm -hmm. trying to encourage global civil society, mm -hmm. mobilize them, all the different networks to understand that this third stage is beyond human control. Mm -hmm. If the moment algorithms start thinking on their own and you cannot follow it. How can you control something you cannot see? Yeah. Just to make it very clear, okay. very simple, uh, you are saying we have to stop the development of artificial intelligence uh, uh, beyond a certain point. Yes. I would say the move to, to go from AI mm -hmm. to artif artificial intelligence to artificial super intelligence okay. has to be stopped yeah. at this point. Yeah. And if I understand you right, uh, this move is the move where it gets out of control. Yeah. So ba basically what you're calling for is there's something happening that is in full flow of uh, we losing control of it. Yeah, exactly. We are uh, at the last means of this. Yes. And we have to be aware that this is happening. Yes. And we have to be aware if we don't stop it now. Exactly. It never will be stopped. Exactly. Very well placed, Thomas. Thank you for um, articulating what I was saying very precisely and concretely. Because people have the illusion, since they created the algorithm, they can still control it. But these are people like they're not. They're not programmers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. in fact, you are calling for a real global movement of consciousness that uh, this first is a danger yeah. first second it's an imminent imminent danger yes and it needs a, a global response right now yes because there's no other time to make a decision about this exactly and that the experts in the field don't know what to do with it but they're still doing it because they're embedded in a larger mm -hmm. agenda and so some of some of these uh, bright people are starting to resign mm -hmm. they feel these things getting out of hand so that's maybe too much to ask, but I ask you anyway, uh, how can we do this? Okay. Uh, this can be done by creating dialogue groups. And this is where the internet is going to be valuable to now multiply 
I'm actually creating globally different kinds of um, work. I mean, task forces. These are not study. There's some research, but these are actual action groups in their own countries to start articulating this. And at some point, these are all going to unite together. But uh, the voice, these voices have to be heard. These voices have, have to be heard. And one way to do that is a global petition mm-hmm. movement. Uh, but it's just the beginning. Mm-hmm. And yeah. why, do you think, why do you think that the global civil society has to play a, a particular role in this? What, what, what's the, what's yeah. the specific of what you call global civil society? Yeah. Uh, that this is, yeah. the, as an, if I understand you right, this is yeah. the instrument that you really right. can create an answer to this. No, absolutely. Because number one, global civil society in general, if it's not contaminated from, by economic or political interest, mm-hmm. Global civil society is the seat, is the, is the conscience of, of, of the world. Our conscience of the nation, conscience of the world. We're just interested in, in actual the values, larger values of humanity, like sustainability, like environmental care, like compassion, I mean, justice, without consideration of political power or economic power. So they, without those interests, they would tend to see the situation more objectively and then but not only that, they can also then mobilize with effect. For example, this, this is very interesting movement of young people. It's called the Friday for a Future. I, I'm really watching that as a very interesting phenomena because, I mean, it's in the very, very simple language. What's the point of education when we have no future? That's the protest. And already in a few weeks, they're reaching millions. That's a civil society voice. Mm-hmm. And it's being magnified by mainstream media that's covering this and then it's all over the internet. So that, that there has to be some kind of movement like that that ra- raises awareness on a global scale that this alignment challenge, we are actually, humanity is eating something that it cannot digest mm-hmm. in this sense. There's also an uh, not, I, don't like, I don't want to use the word opportunity. There's a challenge. Mm-hmm. Because on the other hand, if this cannot be stopped, I mean, the solution can only come from what I call super consciousness. Mm-hmm. The, the human being has three levels of consciousness. Mm-hmm. The, con, the, the normal consciousness, mm-hmm. the subconscious, but as many spiritual, different spiritual paths are showing, and even modern science is showing mm-hmm. that there is super consciousness. That we have mm-hmm. act, that in a state of super consciousness, we can have a non-local relationship to the universal intelligence mm-hmm. that created humanity, that was responsible for evolution. Mm-hmm. This is not a religion. This is the conclusion of astrophysics. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, people have not put two and two together. So we feel so helpless if we are in our normal consciousness, but if some of us are able to go into the state of super consciousness, there could be a solution to this alignment challenge. But we have to act fast. And this is why in the new book on AI that I'm writing, I'm bringing in together the findings of the latest mainstream science Mm -hmm. that clearly shows that consciousness governs matter, Mm -hmm. that we are not mere matter. In fact, matter has already disappeared as a scientific Mm -hmm. concept Mm -hmm. in the new science. And when that is brought into a general discussion, then people will see, wow, we're making a real mistake here because we have so reduced the image of the human being to a mere machine Mm -hmm. that can be manipulated. And in fact, it's the tragedy of the transhumanist perspective Mm -hmm. because they don't care if human beings are extinct Mm -hmm. because they feel they can transfer their consciousness to a machine. Mm -hmm. Because after all, a machine called the DNA Mm -hmm. created the consciousness through the by creating the brain. Well, in fact, the reality is that it's consciousness that drives actually the creation and functioning mm-hmm. of DNA. It's the opposite. So the, the whole AI revolution, the ones that they're creating, is based on a wrong image of the human being, based on faulty science, but it's going to destroy the world mm-hmm. because of the imperfect perfection of the technology. Mm-hmm. So I'm happy in this context, Thomas, that there are two scientific organizations which are big time, mainstream scientists. One in Europe based is the Science and Medical Network, and the other US based is the Association of Post Materialist Science. And there are 
you know, together they have over th- thousands of so, scientists that are now the, the Association of Post-Materialist Sciences issued a declaration, which if you read it, is clearly in contradiction to the program of AI. Only they don't say that, but the image of the human being in AI is a total contradiction to what the new science is saying. And the one on the Science and Medical Network released the Galileo report just recently, and the Galileo report just echoes that, but are saying that this is a tragedy if you continue pursuing pure materialistic approaches. So that for me is one of the biggest hope because then that can help people understand we have a deeper facet to our nature as a human being that we, we are now being called to release this, to be fully mm-hmm. human mm-hmm. in the best, in whatever way is mm-hmm. appropriate for us. Mm-hmm. And this is a common task of humanity that really cares about the human species mm-hmm. and not to end up being extinct and be replaced by mm-hmm. machines. If I hear you right, you're expressing two things. Yeah. One is a deep trust in uh, in civil human society. And as I hear you, uh, I, I'm sure you, you're not denying that a lot of dangers that a political extremism gets uh, kind of uh, kindled uh, b- b- by that. Yes. But it seems that there's a trust that this is the place uh, where we as human can, let's put it this way, find ourselves. Mm-hmm. We are not systems interest, maybe economic system interest, political system interest, but our humanness mm-hmm. can be articulated. This is, this is one base uh, thing that you're, you're working from. Yes. And the other thing it seems to be is that you also see, yes, this is a huge challenge that we are right now. But in this challenge, there is also an opportunity that because we are so challenged uh, by basically being overthrown by new technology, that the question, who are we really as humans right now, is forcefully put on the table yeah. to deal with it because if we don't deal with it, we, we have not the means to distinguish uh, what is better, artificial intelligence or human intelligence. So it's a huge challenge, but at, at, at the same time, it forces us to deal with a deeper understanding of who we are mm-hmm. uh, as humans. Yeah. And it seems that scientific research is also supporting that uh, there is a difference between uh, materialistic artificial forms of intelligence and the human spirit. Yes. And that uh, there is a chance that we, uh, in a kind of, of finding a solution to this challenge that we're in, we, we, we are also forced to have a deeper understanding who we are. Yes. Well, you, you have a gift, uh, Thomas, of <laughs> summarizing. No, really, this this beautiful, what you just said. Uh, basically, the uh, I would just want to say that, yes, I place my trust. There are dark sides to global civil society. There are fundamentalist forces there. There are greedy forces there, just like any of the spheres. But on the other hand, uh, we need to, uh, post-materialist science is civil mm-hmm. society. Mm-hmm. That movement, the, um, I would say that post-materialist science scientists are, and, and their movements are part of global civil society because they are creating a new and more accurate image of the human being. Mm-hmm. This is part of the function of global civil society to create new worldviews, which are more accurate, new values that stem out of that, and new, new behavior institutions in society that embody all these higher values. That's what, that's what, that's what the significance of civil society. And, um, the, 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 and the second point, yeah, we have to actually, own, know and own our humanity because the, the sad thing of our time now is that the image of the human being is not a philosophical debate. Mm-hmm. It's a matter of survival. Mm-hmm. If we do not fight for who we are, mm-hmm. we lose we lose the battle. Mm-hmm. People have to wake up in whatever situations in their life they're in, whether they're educators, doctors, mm-hmm. find what is the most meaningfully human behavior mm-hmm. in that context with understanding of the deeper potentials of the human being. And as a result of this pressure, what will happen, Thomas, is I can see actually, potentially anyway, if people wake up, Mm -hmm. the emergence of a new human species. Mm -hmm. It's a higher form. So I, you know, I would call it, for lack of a better, humanity 2.0 or something. Mm -hmm. It's a higher form 
that is actually created out of the crucible of this challenge of artificial mm-hmm. intelligence. The forge is being forged out of that. And uh, when that happens, c- can you imagine if people develop super consciousness? Mm-hmm. I, okay, I'll just give you, to make it so concrete, the new science is saying that it is possible to reconstruct our body for, to our mind through epigenetic processes and neuroscientific processes, um, neuroplasticity and all of that. And the interesting thing is that I'm in touch with super healers. Mm-hmm. They, they, can, they can heal without any medicine. Cancer, stage four cancer in an insta, in a reality in a short period of time. They can work all kinds of healing. They don't understand the science, but the science, the new science is giving the explanation. Mm-hmm. But uh, AI is just promising super health mm-hmm. using nanotechnology and artificial, all of that. They, they haven't come out with anything. But we already, as a superhuman, as, as a human with super consciousness that's able to do that, is already here. Mm-hmm. There are people like that that are already here. And so that's what I will, I'm saying is that, and I, I know of people who already have super consciousness and they, they have conscious experience of the spiritual world and so on. They can have access to that kind of intelligence. And um, so it is very important that. Um, humanity gets to know. To, AI is asking a very forceful question. Mm-hmm. Who are you? Mm-hmm. Human being, who are mm-hmm. you? If you do not answer that question, I'm going to make you either in my own image or I'm going to destroy you. Mm-hmm. That's the... I, I, I think that uh, the listeners of this webcast will uh, really follow you on this thought. Right. Uh, and the question that comes out of that, of course, in a very concrete way, so what to do? Yes, exactly. I mean, you, you started uh, quite early on in the, in the conversation, I replied to, me, to, to, to myself that meditation yeah. uh, <laughs> at, at least is helpful, let's put it that right. way. Yeah, very um, helpful. Uh, That's the so, beginning. Uh, but I think you think a lot of more than just meditate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what, oh, he, he, here we are. Uh, 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 let's say the scenario is real. Uh, we have 20 years. Uh, we, we have a global society that's not really awa- not really yeah. awake to what you're talking about yes. right now. Um, um, what can we do? Well, okay. what, what are you calling us to? Okay. I'm challenging uh, every human being in this planet to actually take on the task of mastering themselves, especially if we do meditation we begin to realize that we have two selves, our day-to-day personal self, that's the one subject to the algorithms, that Mm -hmm. creates our profile in the algorithms. And there's this other self that can reflect the witness, the inner essence of the human being that can witness this and can stop these processes of addiction targeted to our personal self. So that's the first stage. If millions do that, Facebook will have no impact on them. Google will have no impact on them. They're also... uh, new kinds of uh, people, geeks, who are creating new applications that are protecting people from privacy and all of this thing. So that's the first stage. The second stage is to start linking in action groups because by doing that, we harness our... One of the findings is that this higher form of super consciousness, while it can be achieved individually, it's much easier to achieve in a real group process, Mm -hmm. in a real dialogue. Mm -hmm. And this is where I, I resonate deeply with the intent of Evolve Radio mm-hmm. to have this global dialogue because in a real dialogue, a wisdom greater than is present among the people having a dialogue. If a sacred space is created, then this universal intelligence is able to find a place. Mm-hmm. So it's a kind of collective intelligence that's also super conscious. It can give us new insights on what to do, creative tactics, strategies, all of that. Then there's a third level of engaging is and it's to understand the nature of social change. Uh, and there are a number of layers there. First is to understand the principle of structuration. It's a term in social science, which means to say the dynamic process of how structures are created. So basically, if we understand that, how a structure is created, we can tweak already in the process of structuration. 
and you, and you know what, Thomas, the beautiful things that this structuring society is deeply connected, how we relate to each other. Mm-hmm. So it's a relational thing because in the end, all aspects of society are about the relationship of one human being to another. One can be more overpowering, one can be loving. Mm-hmm. It's, it's all there from right. what you already said earlier. So that's structuration. The second thing is it gives us power to understand Wow, you can tweak a whole system if you, you have a real relationship with key decision makers of that system. I used that all the time when I started changing Philippine society. Mm. There would be a terrible president, but he may have a presidential assistant who's open. Mm. And so we, we crack the system to that one person. The entire Philippines is affected. We do this all the time, Thomas. I, I, I mean, I was aware of the structuration a long time ago, so I used that consciously as a strategy to change larger systems. And I find this, this thing out now, nowadays. Many of my friends or not so close friends, and here's network science, the, um, they are all connected into amazing networks. And if you just get to the proper network, there's an influence there of a personal kind that may shift decision-making at the highest levels. Mm. Then there's the, the, the principle of complexity theory called small as uh, sensitive dependence on initial condition, SDIC. So in other words, it's, it's the famous metaphor there is that the flap of a wing of a butterfly can affect, can create a tornado in Florida. I had the occasion one time to ask people who developed the theory, it was not a metaphor, is that actually the case? <laughs> they said it's actually the case, it's not a metaphor. And the reason is that we are all embedded in complex systems and they interact in ways we cannot know. But at the right moment, this can cascade one single thing. And this is happening, for example, on the um, Friday for a Future. One person, <laughs> one 15-year-old Greta from Sweden decided she's not going to accept this junk about people, leaders are not making this decision. Now she's creating a movement of millions. And if this goes on, this... This will have ramifications because you can just imagine the amount of parents that are affected by this decision of the children not to go to school and some of these parents may be big industrialists. And, you know, there's a case here in Germany, the Schweiz Ford Foundation was very famous and rich with the slaughterhouse, but none of their children wanted to inherit it. They told their father, we cannot, it's a twin. So they, we cannot carry on with this thing. It's not, it's against our principle. So that's the foundation is not the biggest support, but the biggest support is of sustainable agriculture because the next generation protested. Right. So the, the systemic impact of small dependence on initial conditions is very important. There's also, I mean, there's several more, but I'm not sure. If right. I'm okay, and then there's what you call uh, morphic resonance. What we do in space of time here is transmitted non-locally to other places around the world, making it easier for others to do this and making them more possible to be influenced by ideas. Then all of a sudden you see what seemingly are spontaneous up, up rise, uprising or consciousness, awareness, but it was also actually affected by what people did. I'm very conscious of this and I just, I just don't count the immediate effect. I count the intensity, the consistency, and all of it. It it will affect future possibilities. Finally, (laughs) um, and this is if you have a spiritual practice, I I do this from a scientific perspective. Uh, I take it from astrophysics that there is very significant evidence that the entire evolution of the universe was guided by a divine, was uh, an overriding intelligence. It's so clear. It's actually clear in anthropic principle of astrophysics where, yeah, maybe for the audience is to say that very fine conditions, I mean, the, the deviation is so fine, it's not due to chance. So knowing that in moments of desperation like this for humanity, unprecedented threat to its existence, I feel it's, it's a scientific possibility for me to connect with the universal intelligence directly out of my super consciousness. And that super intelligence exactly knows what to do. If people are ready to take on mm. whatever it is mm. that can happen, it will create the connections, the situation, 
if more and more people have a conscious relationship to their source of their mm-hmm. existence. Mm-hmm. And this word, it, that's why it's a spiritual battle for me, this thing. You, you cannot fight uh, artificial intelligence if you're a materialist because then you're on the same side as, material, <laughs> as artificial intelligence. And you, if you're an activist, it's a contradiction of, to talk about rights. Machines don't have rights. Yeah. So anyway. That's powerful. Um, yeah. okay. As we are also uh, at the end of our time, just yeah. as a last question. Okay. Uh, Whoever is listening to this and wants to connect with your work, what is the best way to do that? Yeah, the best way to do that is to first, if uh, if they want to connect personally, they can contact me at my email address. It's nperlas, nperlas at protonmail.com. The second thing is to connect to a website. It's called fully-human.org. That's the website is becoming uh, a website that a lot of people are now visiting and it's being, t- there have been 1,500 attempts to hack into it, to destroy it Aye. because it's, because of the kind of message it said. Mm. It's a balanced message, but it's also introducing mm. new forms of mainstream science that are spiritual. And that is very threatening to those who hold a materialist perspective because mm. now it's becoming clear that they are, they will the view of the world. Okay. Thank you very much for making the time for this interview and thank you very much for your work. Yeah, thank you so much, Thomas. Yeah, and, and, yeah it's amazing, your work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening and uh, good evening here from Frankfurt.